All right, welcome everybody uh, to the second day of the uh, double headers, the week of the double headers. Uh, today we will first have Niels Martens and then Kian Salimkani, who will both present, from what I understand, co authored work. Uh, in the case of Niels, we uh, co authored work with Dennis Lenku. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, to briefly present Niels, he's a postdoctoral fellow in the epistemology of the LHC project at the RWTH University in Aachen now, after having defended his DPhil thesis in Oxford <coughs> a year ago under the supervision of David Wallace, Oli Pooley, and Adam Colton. He has a forthcoming publication in philosophy of science, and he's working on philosophy of physics, general philosophy of science, and metaphysics. Uh, today he will be speaking about dark matter equals modified gravity, question mark, scrutinizing the space-time matter distinction throughout, through the modified gravity dark matter lens. Please, Niels. Yes, okay. Thank you for uh, inviting me, and hi, Nick. Um, yeah, so today I'll present a paper with uh, Dennis Lehmkuhl, uh, a historian and philosopher of physics, and should also thank the rest of my team, uh, theoretical physicist Michael Kramer, historian of mathematics Eric Schultz, and uh, philosopher of physics slash theoretical physicist. Yes, there's hmm? But it's just two authors, right? Yeah, uh, but uh, the team consists of those people, including Miguel Angel Carpeo Serquillo, uh, and they've contributed a lot to the discussions. But yeah, the paper is just with Dennis. Um, so this, let me use one slide for a shameless self-promotion of the bigger research unit that our team is part of. Um, I'm quite happy to be part of it. It's quite, I find it quite interesting unit and I would say unique, but it happens to be that our next speaker is a member of the only other research unit of this kind in the world. Um, uh, what's so interesting about it is that it's huge, but also that each of the six projects has one physics PI and then a PI from philosophy of physics or history of physics or sociology of physics. So very interdisciplinary, and they put us in a physics department, so there's a lot of interaction going on, which is quite sweet. Um, so half of the projects are on the practice, the scientific practice, so in general philosophy of science uh, applied to the case of LHC physics, and then there are three uh, projects which are more hardcore history and philosophy of physics, content of LHC physics, and my project is A3, uh, dark matter modified gravity, especially in the context of LHC physics. Okay, so enough about that. Let's get cracking. Um, when we look up at the night sky and see a lot of luminous matter, and we apply the laws of gravity, we kind of do a halfway decent job at explaining their behavior, but there are some crucial discrepancies which pop up at a lot of different scales. Uh, the smallest scale is at the level of galaxies, where we would expect galaxy rotation curves to drop, but they stay constant. Um, galaxy clusters, we would expect based on the gravitational pull of luminous matter that the velocities of the clusters that make the, the galaxies that make up the cluster would be less high than they actually are. Um, also, gravitational lensing, again, the effect, say in the case of galaxy, galaxy lensing is stronger than you would expect based on the luminous matter and normal gravity. And then, even at the scale of uh, cosmology, structure formation, if you would just have the normal density fluctuations in the early universe and normal gravity, we would not have as much structure as we now see. So somehow structure formation has been enhanced compared to what we observe. Um, so yeah, luminous matter, laws of gravity, something is wrong. Two obvious options. Either you add something to the luminous matter, non-luminous matter, dark matter, or you change the laws of gravity, modified gravity. Um, and we agree that uh, in the case in the leper, uh, of co uh, the leper upper left upper corner, um, those are indeed easily distinguished because they are usually you can get away with Newtonian physics. So what the modified gravity people do is they um, modify Newton's law of universal gravitation by enhancing it slightly at small accelerations, so not small sizes, small accelerations. And then with just one free parameter, they can predict most of the rotation curves. And similarly, you can get a long way by just using Newtonian physics and adding dark point particles wherever you want. They're dark, so you can just add them where you need, and you can also account um, for the rotation curves. So yeah, in those cases, we think there is a clear distinction. But as soon as you want to account for the other things, you will need to take into account relativity and quantum theory. And we want to claim that as soon as you go into that domain, the distinction between modified gravity and dark matter, and by extension, the space-time matter distinction starts to become blurred even before you have to worry about quantum gravity. Okay, so 
So our research program in more detail. It's a slight generalization of a program advocated in this book by three members of our research unit, where they basically say, even if you're only interested in one theory, say GR, even if you only care about GR, and you want to understand how special it is and understand it, you should still look at uh, the space, uh, the neighborhood of GR in the space of theories. So we're generalizing this slightly. We're saying even if you only want to understand our current best theories, GR, and the standard model, uh, you would still do very well to look at the neighborhood of those theories in the space of theories, so modified gravity and dark matter theories. And the specific focus of this talk is to what extent this neighborhood suggests the conceptual identification or at least the blurring of the distinction between space-time and matter. So today we're not interested in the metaphysical or explanatory relation between the two. We're just looking at conceptual distinctions. Is there a conceptual distinction um, before we even have to go to quantum gravity? Okay, so let's start with some quotes. Uh, first, the big man himself, Einstein. If two different authors use the words red, hard, or disappointed, no one doubts what they mean that they mean approximately the same thing. But in the case of words such as place or space, there exists a far-reaching uncertainty of interpretation. And then uh, Renashevich. There simply is not a fact of the matter here as to what should count as space and what should count as a physical object in the sense of the original space-time, a space-matter distinction that spawned the debate. Present-day physicists do not employ a language that conforms with this original contrast. And then another giant on whose shoulders we stand, um, Rovelli. Since the discovery of GR, we no longer are sure of what space-time is, and since the discovery of quantum theory, we no longer are sure of what matter is. The very distinction between space-time and matter is likely to be ill-founded, and uh, more dramatically, we have learned so much about the world, but no longer have any clue what space, matter, time, space, and causality are. Uh, okay, two more. Uh, Vasallo, the dualistic metaphysical stance involving geometry matter commitments is of course naive and perfectible. The disagreeing reader can just take it as a mere choice of vocabulary. And my collaborator, Dennis, uh, one of the most important lessons of modern space-time theory is that the distinction between matter and space-time has become more and more blurred. Right, so you might think, all oh, these quotes, they're saying the same thing as what we want to conclude. Why even bother? Um, well, for one thing, these are the exceptions rather than the norm. Another thing is that the specific space um, dark matter modified gravity distinction hasn't explicitly been challenged by anyone in print. We think if you use that lens to look at the broader space time matter distinction, the case will become even more clear that uh, cracks appear in this distinction. Um, um, yeah, and you might also think, well, I mean, isn't all of this stamp collecting? We just, who cares if we call something space time? Who cares if we call something matter? Um, well, we would beg to disagree, of course. Uh, I would say, please come up with a, a distinction that's more more basic when you try to understand nature. And it would seem when I talk to most laymen and most physicists other than quantum gravity physicists, they seem to use this distinction all the time. Uh, for instance, in the space time, in the dark matter modified gravity debate, it's almost as if there are two Kuhnian paradigms. They don't really talk to each other. They fight for the same funding. They don't see, understand each other's successes, etc. So the only thing they agree on is that there really is a distinction between the two camps. And we want to see if we can undermine that. Similarly, in philosophy of space-time, one of the big debates is substantivalism and relationalism. Again, the only thing they agree on is that there is a conceptual distinction between the two. Again, to the, if that's not totally true, that would um, have consequences for both sides of the debate. Okay, overview of the talk. What I want to do today is um, come up with a case study of two theories, which I'll introduce to you in a second, which are um, in the physics literature trying to account for this dark phenomenology. Um, and then I want to extract two families of criteria from the literature. One, the kinetic criteria, which are usually uh, put forward as necessary and or sufficient criteria for something being matter. And another set of uh, criteria usually brought forward as being necessary and or sufficient criteria for something being space-time. And then at the end, I want to evaluate our two theories accordingly to these criteria and see if they're really really can clearly say, oh, they are about matter or dark matter. Oh, they are about space-time, modified space-time, modified gravity. Um, yeah, and then I'll conclude that this is just a first sign 
that there might be a crack in this, this uh, distinction, and by extension, the broader matter space type distinction. Um, okay, so let's start with the two theories. Um, and this is where the one interactive part of the talk uh, comes up. Uh, so I won't yet give you the names of these theories and the authors, just introduce them, and in the end, it would be interesting for me to see uh, you guys raising hands if you think they're either both modified gravity, both dark matter, or one is clearly dark matter and one is clearly modified gravity. Uh, I won't ask you to explain just as a sociological experiment. Okay, here we go, theory one. And so what they do here is they add a new fundamental self-interacting massive complex scalar field. Uh, yeah, so I'll give some hints along the way. Massive, that sounds a lot like matter, so you might think this is a theory about matter. With the following Lagrangian, the two constants lambda and lambda c, which share two scales. And then um, they introduce spontaneous symmetry breaking, um, such that you get an effect of Lagrangian for the associated, again, massive Goldson bosons, the phonons uh, theta, where theta is the phase of the original field. And uh, most compact way of describing this effect of Lagrangian is in terms of x, in terms of x, where x is defined uh, uh, in terms of uh, the phonons like this. And here we see we get this kind of weird non-integer power of fields. And as a particle physicist, you might think, "Huh, oh, that's weird." I'm used to drawing Feynman diagrams where you always have integer power, integer powers. Each power is a line. How am I going to draw? It's like a, a half line or what is this supposed to be? So maybe it doesn't sound like matter after all. Uh, what they do then is they add an empirical term which is um, describing interaction between these phonons and regular matter. And they are inspired by Tevez, tensor vector scalar theory, which is one of the uh, most well-known modified gravity theories. Sounds a lot like modified gravity. Um, yeah, so they say this interaction can be described by the effective metric, modified metric, uh, as follows. Uh, where gamma is a constant, so they slightly generalize it. So in, in Tevez, we would introduce a new vector field here. What they do here is they just use the fourth velocity of the, f the, the one extra field that we had already introduced, and gamma is a constant, and if you would fill in gamma as one, you get the original Tevez back. And then, what they say then? Well, so the issue is that at the level of galaxies, modified gravity has done pretty well, and at smaller, uh, larger levels, dark matter has done quite well. So you basically want a, a natural way of distinguishing between these two levels. And um, that happens to be the case here um, because you can treat this such that for low velocities, uh, so low temperatures, uh, which is exactly the case in galaxies, but not galaxy clusters, these phonons become a superfluid. Um, so superfluid phonon condensate, and they can then use that to derive MONT, where MONT is the modified Newtonian dynamics where we modified Newton's law of universal gravitation. Um, so they can, yeah, at bigger levels, they have the standard dark matter story, and at small levels, galaxy levels, they can rederive Mont from this superfluid from a condensate. And again, you might think, oh, superfluids, that sounds a lot like matter, presumably. OK, theory two. Um, here we don't add a scalar field, but a vector field. Again, it's massive, sounds like matter, uh, described by this Lagrangian. Again, the take-home message is that, again, we get a fractional power, which might make it difficult to draw a Feynman diagram if you want to do that, because you might be a particle physicist. Um, and here, the interaction with normal matter uh, is by this, new, uh, by this new field interacting uh, with the stress energy tensor. Um, and the author then says, well, so basically normal fatter, matter feels an effective metric, a modified metric, set of GD it feels G modified by uh, this new field uh, times a unit vector divided by L, which is a constant, well, yeah, in principle, a constant uh, with the same value as the Hubble radius at the current time. Um, yeah. And interestingly, in the, in the previous case, what we had is that, uh, well, let me say it differently. So what happens in galaxies now is that, again, we get uh, a condensate, but not yet a superfluid condensate. Um, and when it condenses, it pulls in all the surrounding matter, like a dark force. And again, you can do a lot of mathematics and then recover Mont and hence explain the galaxy rotation curves. And interestingly here, the condensate only becomes a superfluid when we go even to uh, higher density. So in the solar system, only then does it become a superfluid. And then all the claims, so it becomes frictionless. 
the whole modification of gravity goes away. We just have normal gravity, and that's good because there are strong solar system con constraints uh, on modified gravity, and here we can just uh, avoid them uh, by it becoming superfluid, and again, you might think, oh, superfluid sounds like matter. Okay, I know this was, this was a lot of information at once, uh, but still, maybe I can test your gut intuition. Uh, two options, the first one, uh, you guys could raise your hand if you think it's either both dark matter theories or both modified gravity theories, maybe think they're both both or both neither. And the second option will be where you think oh, one is clearly dark matter and one is clearly modified gravity. Uh, yeah, it's the first option who thinks there's, they're basically the same thing. Yeah, two hands, I don't see Nick. But, uh, okay, second option, who thinks there's a clear difference? Two, two people, okay, okay, <laughs> there's confusion, <laughs> hey, good. Okay, so then uh, let me uh, uh, not longer keep you in suspense. Yeah, so the first one is developed by two particle physicists, I would say, Lascia Berigiani and Justin Curry. And as part of particle physicists, unsurprisingly, they called their new field a dark matter field. And because it's a superfluid, they would call it superfluid dark matter. And theory two uh, is a version of Linda's theory, who's of course originally a string theorist, but he's been working on gravity for eight years now. So unsurprisingly, he would call this uh, emergent or entropic gravity. And I won't uh, work with Linda's theory here, but I work with Hossenfelder's version, um, where she has um, developed a Lagrangian um, version of Linda's original theory. So, and so when you're signing Linda, do you mean mainly in 2011 or 2010? Uh, 2017. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. So, as you know, in 2011, he derives GR and then he adds a new contribution to the entropy, and then later he gets the dark component out of it. Oh, thank you. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, and interestingly, even though, of course, the theory is called emergent or entropic gravity, Holzenfeld, in a paper, considers not only her own theory a version of modified gravity, but also that of the opponent, superfluid dark matter. So, already she. Uh, um, well, yeah, there's some disagreement there. Okay. Um, yes, okay, so let's try to figure out how we should label these theories. One thing you might think of is, well, superfluidity, that sounds like it should be matter. If there's a superfluid in your theory, then that object is matter. Uh, for those of you who watch the Big Bang Theory, you might have heard of superfluid vacuum theory developed one well, a series by these two physicists. Um, and there, the vacuum, space-time itself, is modeled as a superfluid. So, well, it seems like human space-time could be superfluid. Superfluid is not going to be the criterion we look for. So then you might think, well, something is f visualizable in terms of a Feynman diagram. That sounds a lot like matter. Um, and the problem there is, of course, that these fractional powers, which seem to make it difficult to draw the Feynman diagrams, they are all over the place in condensed matter physics. And these theories, at least the first one, is inspired by condensed matter physics. And of course, there where we have phonons, it seems like we have no problem calling phonons matter, even though we have these weird Lagrangians. You might say, well, they're not really particles, they're not really matter, they're qua quasi-particles, quasi-matter. Uh, I don't know if there's a big difference there, but I'll, I won't dwell on it here. Um, another th worry is, in general, the representational content of Feynman diagrams is, of course, quite controversial. Um, Another point is that Feynman diagrams only work when you're using perturbation theories so to weak couplings, and it will be weird if your definition of matter only applies in perturbation theory. Um, and also in Aachen, we have cosmologists working on um, nonlinearities in G, uh, and that in mathematics you seem to resemble those of quantum field theory so much that you can just draw Feynman diagrams because the mathematics is so similar, and that there it doesn't seem obvious that because we can use the same symbols, the same pictures, that that is necessarily matter. Anyway, okay, much more to be said, but I want to skip over this and go to the two main families of criteria in the literature. I don't necessarily subscribe to any of these. This is kind of the best I have found so far. If anyone has better definitions, yay, please uh, tell them to me uh, during the Q&A. Um, the first set of criteria uh, is often, there are different versions, all logically weaker or stronger than the other, and they're usually brought forward as sufficient and or necessary criteria for something being matter, and they kind of start with Newton. Um, yeah, let me introduce it with the quote by Ovelli again. 
So he says, in the GR world picture, the space-time versus matter distinction collapses. In GR, the matter gravitational field has acquired most, if not all, the attributes that have characterized matter, as opposed to space-time, from Descartes to Feynman. So it satisfies differential equations, it carries energy and momentum, and it can act and also be acted upon, and so on. All right? Um, so let's um, do this a bit more systematically. Basically, the weakest criterion I could come up with that would already, in the case of Newtonian physics and even in the case of SR, would be sufficient to perhaps distinguish immutable absolute well, the space, Minkowski space or Newtonian space, from matter would be just the criterion that uh, this criterion, the object under consideration, is not constant static, hence it changes. I mean, this already, if you take this as criterion for matter, then already indeed, well, Newtonian uh, space and Minkowski space time doesn't satisfy this. The matter in those theories does satisfy it. So this uh, seems like it's the weakest criterion that does the job, at least in those theories. Uh, but let's uh, see if we can strengthen the uh, criteria as it's usually done. So the next step you could do is to insist that this chain, not just any change, but a regular change. And that then leads to the third criteria, which we saw in Rovelli's quote, that this change can be described by differential equations. And then the next step would be the action-reaction principle, which uh, pops up in the literature a lot, of course. So here we're um, taking this regular change described by differential equations to be in response, perhaps partially, perhaps fully, to something external. In other words, we're talking about coupled differential equations. You might think, well, that's what matter is. It acts and reacts. Um, and of course, Newtonian space-time, for instance, doesn't. Um, yeah, then you can crank it up a notch with three energetic criteria, as I like to call them. Let me just introduce all three. There will be a lot of text that's just so we have all the definitions there for the Q&A. The only important new bit every time is the blue bit, so just focus on the blue bit. So again, the next criterion would be to uh, insist on the object carrying energy. And the weakest version of that is saying, well, the energy is you can be ascribed to a particular space-time volume and slightly stronger version would, of course, be to say, well, it can be ascribed not just to any finite volume, but even to each point in space-time. And then the next step would be to say, well, we can represent this energy by a stress energy tensor. And you might think, well, R&D is kind of all the same thing. They're all talking about the object has energy or, or not. Um, and indeed, authors such as Hofer and Patrick Dürer indeed think that's the case. So if we want to talk about the metric in GR, um, uh, you might think, oh, does the metric have energy, gravitational energy? Well, we know that that candidate uh, gravitational energy is not represented by a, a tensor, but by a pseudo tensor. Um, and these authors think, well, it's, it's a pseudo tensor, not a tensor, hence it's not real energy. Um, to carry energy is to carry energy representable by a T mu. Um, uh, so yeah, T mu doesn't satisfy any of these. It satisfies up to four, uh, criterion four at most. Um, but of course, this goes against a long tradition started by Feynman, Bondi, and others, which says, well, gravitational waves, in principle, they can shatter the rock of Gibraltar. They can heat up things. It seems like they can exchange energy, right? Um, and the most recent contribution to this is by James Reed who says, well, okay, sure, it's not a tensor, uh, but in certain models of, say, GR, um, and on a functionalist interpretation of energy, you can still find a notion of energy. Because it's not a tensor, you can do that for every point in space-time, but you can do it for um, uh, every finite volume. Yeah, so they would say, uh, well, it still carries some notion of energy, namely this weaker notion, even though it doesn't carry the stronger ones. Okay, um, yeah? And you might say, okay, well, this is as strong as it gets, but I want to add one more bonus criterion. Uh, was back in Newtonian times, he thought, well, or some people thought, uh, to be matter is to be massive, right? So not just having energy represented by stress energy tensor, but there's also a contribution from the rest mass. Um, in those times, maybe it made a lot of sense. All the matter they knew and understood had mass, so it made a lot of sense. And now you might think, well, why mass? We have photons. Photons are surely not space-time, at least not in the standard model. Uh, they should be on the matter side. I should probably mention, yeah, so when I'm talking about matter and space-time, I'm not distinguishing between fermionic matter and bosonic force carriers. These are on one side. Uh, and then it's really about the biggest coarse-grained distinction, space-time and matter. 
Um, anyway, yeah, so you might think, well, photons should fall on the matter side, uh, so surely rest mass is too strong a criterion. Um, and yeah, why mass, why not spin, why not something else? Um, so maybe it should be this, this junction of all these quantum numbers. Anyway, but I went, wanted to mention this anyway, as you will, the reason you will see on this slide. So now we have this criteria, and now we can evaluate some objects which we might think should be clearly matter or clearly not. And yeah, so as I said, Newtonian space-time, Minkowski space-time, uh, these in special relativity don't satisfy any of them. They're static kinetic strength zero. They are definitely uh, not matter. Then uh, for non-trivial metrics, as they feature in DR, uh, depending on where you, um, uh, if you agree with uh, her friend Patrick Dürer or uh, with the James Reed uh, Feynman tradition, you might think, oh, the metric satisfies the action reaction principle or it also carries energy, but then only energy is ascribable to a region. So of course, we know, well, even GR is already kind of blurring the boundary. Um, yeah, and then photons, at least in the standard model, satisfy almost the highest criterion. They have an energy representable by T mu nu. And then electron, of course, satisfy the highest one that has mass. And now it seems the two fields in all, each of these theories, the fields that were added, they had a team in you associated with them and even they were massive. So it seems like they are really as much matter, as much dark matter as they could possibly be. Um, you might not totally agree with me and say, well, what does mass mean? If, if you're a particle physicist, you might say, well, mass to me means the pole in the uh, propagator and we don't really have Feynman diagrams, Feynman rules, so I don't know what mass means anymore in these theories. So maybe, maybe that's reason to just say seven, which would still make these new fields pretty matter-like. And in any case, they're both equally matter-like. You might also say, well, uh, in condensed matter physics, which inspires these theories, we have no problem calling phon phonons massive. So we should just adopt the notion of mass that's normal in condensed matter physics. These new fields both have that. So they're very much matter-like, very much dark matter. So yeah, it seems that these two theories, or at least the new fields that they add in each case, they are as much, one is as much uh, material object or dark matter as the other. And of course, if you think there's a space-time, strict space-time matter distinction, dark matter modified gravity distinction, you think, oh, we're done, right? If these are fully dark matter, they cannot be modified gravity. Uh, so these people, these authors were wrong, at least one of these authors was wrong. Um, but of course, we are trying to figure out whether there's such a distinction. So we will also want to check to what extent these are like modified gravity. Uh, and then we might be in for some surprises. Yeah, uh, why other reasons we might want to uh, keep on going uh, is that uh, even though these new fields have mass energy momentum associated with them, the authors acknowledge that that's not what's doing the job. That's not what uh, is accounting for the effects. It's not the, you can basically ignore the contribution um, of this mass energy to, it's not a relevant source of gravity. Uh, the fact that what the theories really do when they're explaining the dark phenomenology, all of that stuff can be told in terms of effective metrics. Um, and yes, they have mass energy momentum, but that's not playing any strong explanatory role. And even Rovelli himself admits the following, says it's not to say that the gravitational field is exactly the same object as any other field. The very fact that it admits an interpretation in geometrical terms witnesses to its peculiarity. Right, so there seems to be something uh, more geometrical um, about um, the metric, for instance. Okay, so what I want to do now is turn to another set of criteria, usually uh, brought forward as necessary and or sufficient criteria for something being called space-time, and then we'll evaluate these theories according to these criteria. Again, I'm not, you see in a minute that they are not as easily orderable logically as, as the first set of criteria. Um, so I'm in principle very sympathetic to, I guess, I think David Baker gave a talk here recently about uh, space-time being a cluster concept, but I didn't know. Anyway, Dave Baker put a paper on the archive where he says space-time is a cluster concept, like family resemblances, there's not just one necessary or sufficient criterion. Um, it's just like there's a whole bunch of things that are space-time-like, and as long as you have enough of them, um, then something is space-time, right? Just that like in psychology, usually, I don't know, 
depression, there's a list of 20 things, you just need to tick five of them and you, you're depressed. Right? So, um, principle, man, I'm open to that. Um, I'm just gonna list a few criteria which I think are relevant here. And again, I want to stress, however interesting discussions are about the, uh, the era of explanation and some of the type of relationalism, metaphysical relations, here I just want to talk about the concept of space-time and the concept of matter, or your concept of space-time. Okay, so the weakest notion of space-time you might want to put forward, I claim, is uh, that something is a space-time only, if and only if it is a differentiable manifold. And then, of course, you might think, well, uh, that suffers from the whole argument, and indeed, Bolton says, uh, yeah, this, this is too weak a notion of space-time. says, but just qua differentiable manifold, abstracting from the metrical and affine structure, Erwin and Norton, so the author of the whole argument, their space-time has none of the paradigm spatial-temporal properties. Light con structure is not defined. Past and future cannot be distinguished. Distance relations do not exist. Spatial-temporal structure is metrical structure, and the substantivalist will certainly insist that space-time is spatial-temporal structure. Right? So you might think, okay, something we would need to add to the differentiable manifold is a connection, or you might think metric, or you might think both. Um, uh, <coughs> yeah. However, that seems. Yeah. yeah. Question, why would adding a connection alone help? I mean, does it add a split between space and time or something? It's sort of probably not, right? Uh, yeah, no, that was the net point. So you might say this is, yeah, I think this is still too weak. And um, this is not going to distinguish between the space and the space time. So indeed, you might insist, as uh, you just did, great, um, that, this yeah, that what these things that you add need to have a Lorentzian signature, right? And then there might be Wileyans in the room who think, no, no, wait, this is too much. Um, all we need is, um, oh, sorry, yeah, so here I introduce a Lorentzian metric. And if you're a Wileyan, you might think, that's too much because there's no matter of fact as to whether two things at separate locations have the same size. So all we need is a slightly weaker condition, namely an equivalence class of Lorentzian metrics up to local scale. Uh, so we only need Lorentzian conformal structure. So there's a whole bunch of possibilities. I don't want to take any stance on these, but I think they're all uh, incomplete. And the reasons basically all boil down to these things as being abstract mathematical theoretical terms which don't necessarily yet have connected to physical observables. Um, so one thing is, yes, maybe we have now distinguished space from space-time in some broad sense. We haven't really distinguished space-time from time-space. Yes, we have a, a signature, a minus sign, which says, oh, well, one set of dimensions is different from the other one, but why is the one space-time and the three, uh, sorry, is, why is the one time and the three or four, or whatever, um, space? Also, in principle, you could decide to represent configuration space with these structures. Uh, we don't think configuration, well, most pe many people think configuration space is not the same thing uh, as normal space, so somehow it seems that the space we after, the space time we are after is something more. Um, and also, uh, what happens if we have multiple metrics or multiple connections, or you have theories where you have uh, uh, yeah, so for multiple connections, you have a wall co connection and a Levitz Vita connection, um, or you just say, well, in principle, I can define a Finzel metric for every particle. So, does that mean for every particle we have a, a new space time? It seems like in every model you would, should have at most one uh, space time. Um, and of course, in the cases of modified gravity, we will have at least two metrics, right? You have the standard G mu nu, and then you see it gets modified. So, we have another metric as well, an effective modified metric. So do we then have two space times, a normal space time and a modified one, which is the, the physical one? Um, and, of, and like in Palatini approaches, you're even, uh, you don't have metric compatibility anymore, metric and connection come apart. <coughs> which one is the real space time? Are they all space times? It seems like we have this plurality going on. So I think <coughs> this all arises from not yet connecting uh, sufficiently much with um, physics. Um, and the following two quotes are going to back me up on that. So Hofer says, recall the roots of substantivalism, the usefulness of space-time in explaining and integrating certain physical phenomena, and then he gives, gives an interesting list for us, such as free fall, acceleration, light propagation, yeah, such as free fall, acceleration, and light propagation. The explanatory work of space-time in GR is all done by the metric field and not by the manifold alone. Right, so he says, 
space time is supposed to explain something and there are a few thing, three things it might explain and just having this mathematical, mathematical object in your theory doesn't necessarily do so. And my collaborator says, paradigm examples for geometrical phenomena do of course include phenomena involving the behavior of rods and clocks, time dilation, length contraction, simple distance measurements, but also for instance, the geodesic motion of test bodies. Just having any of these mathematical structures I've mentioned so far is not gonna necessarily give you this. So I think we should focus on top of the previous mathematical criteria, on more physical criteria. One thing, for instance, in Craig Callender's book, you might uh, propose to solve the problem of distinguishing space-time from time-space, so saying why is the one dimension, the temporal one, and the other is the spatial one, is by looking at initial value problems, you're saying, well, if you take the one to be the, if you look at the matter in the space-time and its dynamics, if you then take the one to be time, and the other ones to be space, then you get a well-defined initial value problem. That might be a good reason to indeed call that one time and the other space. Then the two that are of utmost importance here, importance here. One is the geodesic criterion, uh, which we want to define as follows. So you take test particles and or light rays, and say if those were around, whatever initial conditions they have, they would follow the trajectories of the same single family of geodesics. Uh, so they can be of a single metric or connection, or of course, if they're compatible with each other uh, of both. Yeah, so you check um, for something to really be a space time, then test particles and light rays should follow the GED6 of uh, that kind of space time. And of course, it's going to be interesting when we want to say, well, is the modified metric the, the real physical space time or the unmodified one? Well, you check what test particles and light rays do. And then you still don't have everything. You don't have length contraction, time relation, you can do distance measurements. So on top of that, you presumably want to check whether the strong equivalence principle is valid, so whether special relativity is local in some sense. Of course, several people, Alan and Knox, people in this room, have written papers that it's only approximately valid, even in GR, so there's a lot of stuff we could talk about in, a couple, in the next few days. Uh, but yeah, presumably, something like that uh, is going to play a role. Okay, so in the last few minutes, let me um, use these criteria to evaluate the two theories. Quick recap, they are both equally dark matter-like. So how modified gravity-like are they? Uh, yeah, so both authors in their paper, sets of authors, talk about everything being explainable in terms of effective metric, modified metrics. So as long as they mean the same thing, well, it's a bit unclear what they mean, but if they mean the same thing, presumably they are equally modified gravity-like. Um, so then we have theories which are both, one is called dark matter, one is called modified gravity, but they both are equally DM-like and equally MG-like. Um, okay, so let's first check. Actually, since time is running up, I'm going to skip over this because it basically boils down to, well, in GR, presumably, it's just an additional postulate that this equivalence principle holds. So no reason to not also po postulate it in these theories. You get chronogeometric meaning, etc. So let's just do that. The most interesting criterion is the UDC criterion, so what the test particles and light rays do. Um, yeah, so quick recap. In theory one, we saw this was inspired by Tevez, so a uh, uh, popular modified gravity theory. Uh, there are two slight differences. So in Tevez, we would introduce a new vector field. Here, we didn't need to do that. We just had a scalar field and used its four velocity. And in Tevez, there was one specific value for g, namely one. And here, this is generalized to any possible value for g. Um, so in principle, what we would need to do now, and what Dennis and I will uh, sit down in two weeks and try to do, but it might just be too big to include in this paper, is to rederive uh, kind of an analog of the geodesic theorem in GR, but then for these theories. Uh, but for now, we can at least have the, the interesting tentative conclusion. We know that for gamma is one, this reduces to Tevez, and we know that in Tevez, uh, the geodesic criterion is satisfied, and particles and light rays follow the modified um, GD6. So we know that at least for one value of gamma, and the authors don't constrain gamma, they leave it open for future work, so this might well be the real value. We know for one that um, the DUDC criterion and basically all our geometric criteria are indeed satisfied, so we, we have an important proof of concept. We now see that we just could design a theory which stands a chance of actually being good, the correct theory, which is maximally dark matter-like, also maximally modified gravity-like. Um, so in retrospect, uh, I think it should have not been too, 
Yes, it should have actually been weird that we thought that there were two sets of criteria, one for matter and one for space-time. If you really think there is a strict dichotomy between matter and space-time, presumably you then think, well, there's one criterion. If it satisfied something, is say, space-time. If it's not satisfied, it's matter. It's weird that we have two separate criteria, because then a priori you would think, well, an object could satisfy one and not the other, or both, or neither, etc. So we'd have more possibilities. So basically, the take-home message uh, I want to give you is that um, um, just the fact that the theories which historically we first came into contact with, special relativity, Newtonian physics, it was just an exception in the space of theories. It was just an exception that all their objects either were scored fully on the kinetic criteria and zero on the geometric criteria or the other way around. It seems plausible that in general in the space of theories, there's no reason that that always that coincidence happens. They just uh, could be partially like matter like partially modified gravity like etc. Um, and what I think is especially interesting about this proof of concept is if you compare this to an earlier theory of Curie. So here, instead of one scalar field, he introduces two, and then one takes care of modifying gravity at the appropriate regime. One takes care of dark matter effects, and then how oh, we have a theory that does both. But that's of course not very surprising. I mean, we always had theories, even Newtonian physics. Um, uh, special relativity, where we had some fields which were, like the metric, which were space timey, other fields where it's complete or completely matter like, so that they came up with two new fields and uh, together they play both roles. That's not interesting. Now, in this new theory, we have one new field and then we do this trick where we get a vector, scalar field, we get a vector field out of it by taking the forward velocity and then using that we can modify gravity and the scalar field itself takes care of the dark matter aspects. And then uh, quickly, theory two. Uh, there, in principle, we should also rederive uh, the geodesic theorem to figure out what's going on. I talked to Hosselfeld, and she says, well, test particles would follow the geodesics of this modified matrix, so not G, but G minus the extra field and some factors. Uh, but photons do follow the geodesics of the original G. So you said theory one is actually fully modified gra gravity-like, even though the authors call it a superfluid dark matter theory. And Hosenfelder, if this can substantiate, be substantiated, then her theory is not fully uh, modified gravity-like, according to the criteria I proposed, um, because photons are not feeling this modified metric, right? So even the, she considered her own theory and the other theory modified gravity-like, it now seems, at least for this value of gamma, that her own theory is less modified gravity-like than the superfluid dark matter theory. Um, so I am just going to skip over this, except for saying they have a new paper which makes everything more messy. We can talk about this if you want during Q&A. Uh, so the conclusions, we have compared these two theories. Uh, I've quickly dismissed superfluidity and Feynman diagrams as relevant criteria and talked about the two most famous, or the two biggest families of criteria. The first one, Whichever member of that set you choose, both theories are going to be equally dark matter-like. And geometric criteria are only tentative conclusions, but it seems at least for um, the Tefes value of gamma. And in the superfluid regime, the superfluid dark matter theory is fully modified gravity-like, fully space-timey, and theory two actually doesn't seem to be fully space-timey because the photons are not uh, feeling the modified space-time. Yeah, so uh, what I want to conclude is that this case study is a first sign that at least the modified gravity dark matter distinction is blurred, and by extension the broader space dark matter distinction. How this generalizes, uh, I don't know yet. Maybe Susie dark matter really is dark matter. Uh, maybe the, we can't generalize it that far. Um, uh, the next step that our team is interested in is the certain theories where you can just use a conformal transformation and go from a gravity theory to a theory with a modified gravity theory to a theory which is with GR plus an excess scalar field. And Kambat and Kunz, who came up yesterday, they wrote in a written paper where they generalized this to a large class of modified gravity theories, say just with the conformal symmetry. Um, you can go back and forth, so the distinction isn't there. Okay, I'm going to stop. So we have a very, very short time for okay. Q&A and a only. Nick informs me that he doesn't really have a question, so maybe Niels? Uh, yeah, um, Niels. Um, we should have a problem. Um, it's a game for being geometric. Um, how, how did you mean this exactly? I mean, is 
something that is also usually very common for all fields. So uh, why is this something geometric? Is it because of the split? Oh, no, sorry. I was saying up to the criteria before then oh, didn't tell you why something is space time rather than time space as in oh. yes you have some of distinguish the one dimension from the oh, end but uh why is one time why the other space uh well calendar suggestion others have suggested look at the initial value problem you, you will only get one if you, if you take the one as time you will get a well-defined initial value problem you would somehow take uh, take it as three temporal dimensions in one space and dimension that's going to be problematic without even going to the quantum context, because say, if you already want to consider permutation rates, which are, after all, motivations of a fixed background matrix, right? If you already don't want to go that far, and if you then allow for permutation rates, you can read out elasticity, so a certain kind of transformation property leading to the lowest variance, which is different to um, the elasticity, say, of the neck magnetic wave, so it's, it's, it's going to two rather than one, uh, and so on, right? And it corresponds to the quantum spin later on. And this is in some sense a feature which uh, gravitation wave shares with all the other fields, right? Mm. You can count through from zero, one half, one, one half, uh, and so on. Ah, cool. I didn't notice. Okay, thanks. You're saying this is a criterion for the geometric? Uh, actually, for the other um, thing, for the. So that would make it more map. Uh, it depends, mm. of course, whether you count low and very somehow as a dynamic feature or as a geometric feature, because somehow the helicity is linked to it. I think that you cannot really use it because, as you were saying later, uh, it has been shown that you can write these conformal couple matter fields as some FFR gravity, and then you would get the same uh, modified uh, gravitational wave uh, density for uh, it, you know, in the cases where you would have gotten other uh, things. But presumably, that transformation is going to rule out any of these criteria, right? Yeah. You can always transform, yeah, if that's really uh, a strong duality. And I really made it as a criteria in the context of GR rather, or okay. perturbations in GR being okay, yeah. Because otherwise, if you went to the quantum context, you could even take the spin directly as a. Okay, Nick, do you have a quick question? You need to switch on your mic again. Let me, so let me try it. Um, so this was a very interesting talk, I think I learned quite a lot. So, but it just sort of occurred to me at the end. Um, so another case that might be interesting here is um, sort of massless spin two um, accounts of gravity. So you have something like a classical graviton field in a, in a Minkowski background, you approach GR that way. I mean, so, I guess, so the question just is, if you have, if, so something like a sort of Feynman approach, people have done this kind of thing, DESA. Um, according to the different criteria, do the, where does the massive spin two field end up? Does, it end, does that end up on the, gra from the space time side, or does that end up on the matter side, or do the same issues kind of come up in that case? Uh, yes, good. Uh, yes, I, I don't know the answer to that, but, uh, Maybe Kian can enlighten me over the next few days. Some of the same things will come up again, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Although I must, yeah, so I must reiterate, presumably having mass is definitely too strong a criteria because then photons are ruled out. Um, but um, yes, I don't know. Uh, that's an interesting case. And we're trying to figure out interesting cases for the next paper. So thanks. Okay, I'm afraid we're out of time. So please join me in thanking Niels once again.